Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. Tonight's show is made possible because Organic Man Coffee Trike is keeping me alive. Without coffee, the human race would have packed it in a long time ago. Coffee brought about the end of the Dark Ages. Pick up the best coffee in the world at 4501 McPherson. If you aren't in Laredo, you can get the life-affirming drink by going to OrganicManCoffeeTrike.shop. Their new hours are 6.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. And uh, as you can see, I I get my coffee there. Best coffee on the planet. Yeah, that that's a little bag that I get once in a while. Lasts me about a week. Saturday, August 26, 2023, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., I'll be at the 2023 Wonderland UFO Festival, uh, 4522 Fredericksburg in San Antonio. It's free to attend. The air conditioning will be on. Last year, it was a pretty spectacular event. Don't miss out. Mark your calendars, October 26th, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. In case you hadn't noticed, I've rearranged the studio just a bit. Uh, the camera is slightly at an angle because I had to move the computer to one side so I could see the TV set. So I had to angle things around and, well, hopefully this works out better than the last arrangement. Tusk1157 has sent me an article about a tribe of Indians who spoke Welsh. Uh, this led to me looking into some of the history about the Americas, where populate, or, you know, who populated the place, who got here, who really was here before old Columbus arrived on the scene. A lot of folks like to reference the theory that the Americas were populated by humans crossing from Siberia to Alaska across a land bridge. This idea was first proposed back in 1590 and has been generally accepted since the 1930s. Uh, you watch any TV shows, well, the ones I watch, and you will see them referencing that land bridge. It's almost like it's a proven fact. They've got photographs of people coming across that thing. No matter how many people say that it happened, there is no evidence to prove it. It's still just a theory. The boys in the white lab coats say that humans migrated from Siberia about 13,000 years ago. Uh, they did this out of curiosity, or uh, they were following the herds of animals that they were hunting who crossed the land bridge out of curiosity as well. Maybe it was instincts. Maybe it was just the, the need to wander. Scientists believe the people living in South Asia four to 5,000 years ago were the first humans to invent ocean-going technology. They built catamarans or outrigger canoes, mounted sails to use wind power to save on the shoulders and the arms. Can you imagine rowing a canoe for a couple of months You'd have an upper body that looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger and a lower body that looked like Woody Allen. Grip the body a little bitty legs from sitting in the canoe too long. Well, by sailing around their part of the world, they managed to colonize most of the Pacific Islands, eventually winding up into New Zealand. The folks studying the other side of the planet say the Phoenicians started building sailing ships 5,000 years ago. They sailed to all parts of the Mediterranean, but they refused to go beyond the Straits of Hercules. Uh, we know them today as the Straits of Gibraltar. Uh, they wouldn't pass through this waterway until 600 B.C., According to Plato, Atlantis was a wealthy, advanced civilization that conquered a lot of the Atlantic Ocean and some of Europe. Uh, 
That's my place again. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> anyway, uh, they sunk below the waves sometime around 9,600 B.C. out in the Atlantic. Uh, that's what they say. This is according to Plato, who got his information from the Egyptians. The Ministry of Truth is a department in George Orwell's novel, 1984, that is responsible for rewriting history to fit party doctrine for propaganda effect. Its name is ironic as it is concerned with falsifying records and recreating the past to manipulate and control the population. You'll find a fine example of this simply by using any search engine. Why would anybody try to manipulate the truth concerning who found the Americas? Why are some humans so resistant to change, even when staring in the face of evidence? It's all tied up with a person's need for social acceptance. We are all social animals, and we have been trained to cooperate within our social groups. You know, public school. This makes us skilled at justifying our beliefs and arguing our case to others. The American Revolution created the Columbus most of us learned about in school. Prior to the 18th century, he was in a historical footnote with no connection whatsoever to the 13 colonies. After all, he never landed on the continent. Even though he was Italian, he sailed under the Spanish flag and landed in the Bahamas. Columbus never set foot on the rest of the place. He never touched of the colonies. Uh, when the need developed for a national history with no connection to Britain, uh, during the American Revolution, colonists seized upon this Italian. He was a blank slate on whom post-revolution America could project the virtues of they, or what they wanted to see in their new nation. The process of writing Columbus was one of the defining means to create America in other people's eyes. He was brave and adventurous. He didn't go along with the idea of the flat earth. He thought outside the box. Once the idea of Columbus discovering the Americas was being spread about, it became the doctrine of modern thinking. Any ideas of others coming before Columbus were ridiculed and squashed. No, 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 they couldn't have done it. Thousands of years ago, the South Asians are sailing all over the Pacific, landing on every island they come to. Yet the Europeans are afraid to sail out past the Canary Islands until 1492. That's what they say. One story of Atlantic exploration began with the death of King, a uh, Welsh king, Owain Gwanid in 1170. The king's death led to a dispute among his sons. David seized the throne, causing Prince Madoc and his brother Ryard to leave town in search of adventure. They wanted nothing to do with their families or their homeland. All of Europe was spoken for already, uh, so they set sail to the west. 322 years before Columbus was entertaining the Queen of Spain with stories of vast wealth to be had if she would just finance his trip. I have to ask, why do some Welsh names have so many consonants? One of my favorite writers, Jasper Ford, spells his last name with two F's, F-F-O-R-D. Uh, Gwened has two D's at the end. A David also had two D's on the end. I know a lot of writers like to beef up their articles by putting in a bunch of thens and alsos, uh, making their story several pages longer, but why the double letters? It's, uh, 
It makes it hard to read and sometimes hard to look up. If you type in Ford with two Fs, a lot of times the computer will correct it for you and remove one. A Prince Maddox set sail for parts unknown, or at least that's what they say. He, along with his crew, sailed west in what looked like Viking-styled ships. Uh, just think of a Viking ship, and that's kind of what they were in, as opposed to what Columbus had. The Vikings had had a huge influence on anyone they had encountered. A lot of people didn't read or write. Uh, this was used as a form of control. The royals were sent to learn things that the peasants never had access to. You only knew what the folks in charge let you learn, kind of like today. The Vikings did a lot of trading with Europeans. Along with their goods came stories of adventures. Perhaps Maddox had heard about the lands beyond the western horizon. He was using a Viking-style ship. Now, maybe he was also using Viking legends, stories as his guide. If you look at a map of the world, it's way off proportions. Now, just look at Greenland. It looks huge. It's not shaped like a giant V. It looks that way because you're taking a round shape and you're smashing it flat on a flat surface. Uh, there's no explanation for why Maddock and his crew sailed so far south, but he and his boats wound up in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, a direct course of travel from England to the United States, or from Britain to the United States, you'd actually pass close to Greenland. But him and his fellow crewmen, they sailed south and they crossed the Atlantic uh, almost at the level with northern Africa. Maybe they didn't have a map with them. Or maybe they were just using memories of a map that they had seen. Uh, probably this had something to do with the trade winds. The wind blows from east to west in the northern Atlantic. And in the middle of the Atlantic, it blows from the east to the west, making sailing a lot easier because that's where the wind is. When you have a wind-powered ship, you go where the wind blows you. The Perry Reese map was created by Ottoman Turkish cartographer Ahmed Muhideen Piri in 1513, and it shows the entire world, including parts that they weren't supposed to know about back then. Rees drew up his map on gazelle skin using 20 different sources of information. He made sure that on the map he noted where he got the information that he was referencing. He used eight Ptolemaic maps from the second century. He used Portuguese maps, Arabic maps, and one that had been drawn up by old Chris. Uh, some sources used by Piri dated back to 400 BC. There were maps showing parts of the world that they weren't supposed to know about yet, like Antarctica, and it shows the place without any ice. Prince Maddock uh, spotted an inlet that looked suitable for his intentions of creating his own place, his own kingdom. Uh, the crew got busy building a settlement. The, the location is lost to history. But it may have been east of Mobile Bay, uh, somewhere in that vicinity. Maybe a mile or two, maybe 50 or 100. But it was somewhere to the east of Mobile Bay, uh, they believe. He then voluntold a bunch of his followers to stay there and get busy creating his kingdom while he was going to return to Wales and pick up some more folks and supplies. Excluding, of course, uh, King David, who he still had issues with. More Welsh people sailed across the Atlantic to join these colonists. This would have been about 1171, 1172. Migrants who would have chosen to accompany Maddock in this unknown adventure 
would have had an underlying reason for leaving. Uh, maybe they were trying to escape religious persecution, uh, political nonsense. Uh, maybe it was the idea that they could have their own bit of the what is now called the American dream. I guess back then it would have been the Welsh dream. Uh, four of Maddox's brothers decided to go with him and his sister. Uh, they set sail for the uh, New World, which wasn't being called the New World yet. They probably said something along the lines of, well, it can't be any worse than staying here. The charisma which Maddox exercised must have been exceptional in persuading these folks to risk life, limb, financial difficulties on a pretty dangerous venture. Uh, during this second expedition, Maddox assembled people with skills to sustain the community. You had to have a blacksmith. You had to have woodworking folks. You had to have farmers, people that could keep you alive. Things like that. He hoped to create his own kingdom on the other side of the Atlantic. His second arrival in the New World uh, got off to a slightly messed up start. A Maddox was unable to locate the camp that he'd left behind. Uh, sounds a lot like the story about the Roanoke folks. The ships sailed up and down, trying to find the folks that he'd left behind. The people at the new town should have been looking for the arrival of Maddox and uh, their fellow countrymen. A signal fire would have been lit to show the location to land. No sign was ever found. A hundred and twenty Welshmen vanished without a trace. Uh, perhaps fearing that the locals had attacked the settlers and either took them captive or maybe killed them, a Maddox decided to move on down the coast a bit. He and his crew made landfall in either Georgia or Alabama. Now, they didn't stay long because the entire crew made their way north using their ships as far as they could get, and then they continued on foot. Legend has it they wound up in Cahuta Mountains, which is a small mountain range at the southern end of the Appalachian Mountains. There, they built a fortification to prevent the locals from doing to them as they believed had happened to the first group. Fort Mountain takes its name from the remnants of a stone formation that is located in the park. Of course, the the uh, boys in the white lab coats tell you the Indians built those. Uh, the ancient 885-foot-long zigzagging rock wall was built from stones that were from the summit of the mountain. Well, it's easier to move rocks downhill than up. The wall is 12 feet thick. On the uphill side of the wall, they found pits, carns, small cylindrical structures, stone rings, and the ruins of a gateway. The story comes from a local tribe is that this was built by men who just showed up one day, about 800 years ago. These men had long, light-colored hair and beards. They dressed in clothing that sounds an awful lot like they were from Europe. Their language was hard to understand, but eventually the tribe was able to determine that these men had come from Wales. Delaware Indian legends tell of their migration eastward from the far west, and that they met up with a race of light-skinned, tall people that they called the Elegiwi until they chased them off for whatever reasons. Uh, I guess they just didn't get along. Uh, they used the Iroquois Indians as well. The Elegiwi moved northwest to the Cherokee territory and they stayed with them for a time. And the Cherokee recall, refer to these people as the Vinicula, or the moon-eyed people, who were tall, fair-skinned, with light hair and gray eyes, and they were said to carry strange weapons and weird-looking tools. 
Time passed and the adventurers became curious and they moved up to Alabama River, where, so legend tells us, Maddox stopped at the DeSoto Falls on the Coosa River, where their next fortification was built. There is a fortification in the hills that is practically an exact replica of Dalwadelen Castle, where Prince Maddox was born. It looks a lot like a Welsh castle, which the locals would have had no use for. Indians didn't build big stone walls. Uh, not like this one. The story continues that the Welsh people moved north, uh, following either their instincts or maybe the locals had passed on suggestions that there's far better land at another location. You guys should go that way. We'll stay here. See ya. Uh, their next stop was the Duck River near Manchester, Tennessee. Today, you can find an old stone fort there. Legend says that this was also built by Prince Maddock. Perhaps these Welch folks kept claiming land that belonged to one Indian tribe or another, but they kept moving north and west, uh, traveling by foot. The Welch would eventually have come to the Tennessee River. They knew how to build boats, and going by river would have been a lot easier than walking. The Tennessee River would have taken them to the Ohio River. At this time, none of these names were in use. The Indians had their own names for these rivers. The Ohio can take a big boat to the Mississippi. By following the mighty mists, the going would have been a bit more difficult since the Mississippi has a very strong flow to the south. But the Welch were heading north. Why they kept going north and west, we don't know. There is no record of why they kept moving until they came to the Missouri River. Uh, they followed this until they encountered the Mandan tribe. Of all the Indian tribes that they had met, the Mandan were the most accepting to these people. So the Welsh moved in with them. The Mandan were a peaceful tribe of the Sioux Nation. Like other Indian tribes, the Mandan were shamanic. They believed in the great spirit Maka, which is the mother of the earth, and other spiritual beings. The Mandan also had a very unique legend. They said that their ancestors had come many miles across a huge body of water to the east. They also had a story that involved Mary and Jesus which was incorporated into their legends. With the arrival of Maddock and his followers, the Mandan welcomed them as having come from many miles across the great body of water, and the Welsh were all Christians. Now, Jesus and Mary may have come up in some point in their conversation, and this kind of made the Welsh and the Mandan related. Having no means of making clothing or European tools, the new arrivals took up Indian ways of doing things. The Indians didn't take to using many Welsh words. Uh, they did, I'm sorry, they did take to using many Welsh words. And they constructed their villages to look like something you'd find in Europe. Many villagers were laid out looking like towns in Wales. The Indians also adopted the Welsh boat called a coracle. Unlike a canoe, a coracle was kind of square with a pointy end. It was a lot more stable than a canoe, and you could haul a lot more people and equipment. Lacking a written history, the Mandan relied on oral history, passing on these stories of Prince Maddock and his fellow Welsh people. Land was being sectioned off by the king of Spain, who decided that he owned everything since Columbus had been working for him. Hey, we paid for the trip. We own the land. Well, a bunch of other kings were not too happy with Spain controlling everything over the horizon. 
Back in the 15th century, the world powers were Spain, Portugal, and the Netherlands. All the other countries were just kind of there. Portugal tried to move in on the New World. Uh, this led to a lot of fighting breaking out between Portugal and Spain. Both of these countries had a very strong Catholic religion, so they both took their case to the Pope, who decreed that in the Treaty of Tardesillas, which was signed in Spain in June 7, 1494, he divided the newly discovered lands outside of Europe between the Portuguese Empire and the Spanish Empire along a meridian, that's a north-south line, that ran 370 leagues west of the Cape Verde Islands off of the west coast of Africa. That line of demarcation was about halfway between the Cape Verde Islands which belonged to Portugal, and the Bahama Islands, which had been claimed by Spain. The land to the east would belong to Portugal, and the land to the west would belong to Spain. This would explain why the folks in Brazil speak Portuguese instead of Spanish. As for why the Portuguese speak a different language from Spain, I can't find any uh, reference to it. Historians tell us that the difference in languages is because of when the Moors invaded Spain, they had an effect on their language. Well, they also invaded Portugal, so why didn't they have an effect on their language as well? Nobody involved in sectioning off of the New World had any idea how big the Americas actually were. They also didn't know where all the gold was hidden that they were all looking for. Most of the conquest was being taken place along the coasts. Europeans didn't know how to survive once they landed on this new world, and so they needed supplies to come over from Europe to keep them going. This caused a lot of ships to go back and forth between the new world and the old, and it also led to a lot of the colonists dying, starving to death, eating each other, things like that. They knew how to grow food back in Europe. They knew what kind of food to grow in Europe. Uh, they didn't know how to survive in the Americas. It would be like taking a whole bunch of uh, inner city kids and dropping them off on a farm. They'd all die from starvation while they were looking for some place to plug their cell phones in. You've heard the story of Squanto and the Pilgrims? Well, that's why the Pilgrims were starving to death. Uh, John Dee was a 16th century seer and alchemist who served the royal court under two kings and the Queen of England. While addressing the court, his speech began with, the Lord Maddock, a son of Owen Gwynedd, a prince of North Wales, led a colony of inhabited Tierra, Florida, or thereabouts. A D was trying to get the court to lay claim to parts of the New World, if not all of it. <clears throat> the idea that Maddock had started a colony in or near Florida uh, 600 years before he gave that speech was trying to get England to uh, take a stake in the Americas. There's much documented sur documentation surviving on this claim, but there's no actual proof that this actually ever took place. Uh, all that survives is tradition. Some of these stories surfaced in the medieval courts of Europe during the 1200s, and they've survived up until today. Queen Elizabeth I didn't seem too interested in pursuing the territorial claim. Spain was a long-time enemy of Britain, and just about any excuse would have led to a battle, but she chose not to. In 1810, former Tennessee governor John Sevier, he's the guy that Sevierville is named for, uh, recorded a conversation that he'd had years earlier with Cherokee chief Okanostatla. 
While conducting a military operation against the Cherokee in 1782, Severe saw several strange-looking stone fortifications in the area where Chattanooga sits today. Severe inquired of Okanostosta of their origin, to which the chief replied, It is handed down by the forefathers that the works had been made by the white people who had formerly occupied the country now called Carolina. Uh, Tennessee used to be a part of the Carolinas. When Severe asked who these white people were, the chief answered that he heard from his father and his grandfather that they were a people called Welsh, and they had crossed the Great Water and landed first at the mouth of the Alabama River near Mobile and had driven up the headwaters until they arrived at the Hiwassee River. In 1854, Benjamin Bowden recorded an Indian uh, who spoke of ancient white people who once lived on the Conestoga Creek. After Columbus bumped into the Caribbean islands on his way to India, he told about the great wealth waiting to be taken from the locals. This led to mass immigration to the New World. As Europeans ran into Indians, a feather not dot, they thought that these folks were actually the lost tribes of Israel. Uh, being religious, the settlers wanted to live alongside these people. They had no want, wish, need, nor desire to kill them. Some of the locals, well, they weren't too keen on having these weirdos move in on them. Uh, lots of bloodshed followed encounters with the wrong tribes. It wasn't until Andrew Jackson and his Manifest Destiny that Indians really took a beating. In 1845, the idea that the United States is destined by God to expand its dominion and spread democracy. Uh, Jackson announced there would be no red man east of the Mississippi River. The, the Trail of Tears took place after that. The Mandan lived in the upper Missouri River in what is now central northern Dakota. Mandan Indians didn't use teepees like other tribes, but they lived in permanent buildings that they said resembled European towns. They grew crops, including corn, beans, squash, and tobacco, in fields that surrounded their village, like the Europeans would do. In the 1700s, French explorer Sierre de la Verimbaidre visited the Mandan and wrote a detailed account. He said that they lived in a permanent village. The men had beards, which if you knew Indians, a lot of them don't grow facial hair. As some of the members had blonde hair and they had light-colored eyes. Uh, George Caitlin was an artist who spent eight years living with the Mandan. He was impressed by their white complexions, varying hair color, gray, blue, and hazel eyes. He investigated their history and he traced their origins. He compared Mandan words to Welsh words and he concluded they were the descendants of Prince Maddox's followers. There were travelers' accounts of fair-skinned Indians who spoke some Welsh and used the same grammatical structures. A Welsh soldier was lost in the woods. A band of Indians rescued him. He was able to communicate with them because they spoke Welsh. President Thomas Jefferson asked Lewis and Clark to be on the lookout for Welsh-speaking Indians as they were exploring the new section of the country, the Louisiana Purchase. In 1803, as Lewis and Clark set out to explore this new section of land, they took along a Welsh interpreter, who they figured might come in handy. By this time, St. Louis had transferred from Spanish hands to French and then to the United States. Following the Missouri River, they arrived at the two Mandan villages, Matutnha and Ruptahay. 
on October 1804. The explorers were able to communicate with the Indians using Welch and French. They were shown skeletons that had been wearing brass breastplates that were bearing etchings of the harp, which is a Welch symbol, and they also had carved mermaids. Uh, there was also an inscription that indicated that these dead men had indeed uh, earned virtues so that they had earned their rewards in the afterlife. Uh, Clark and others, after an investigation, concluded that these skeletons were of Maddox men. The Mandan seemed recipient, receptive to these expeditions. Lewis and Clark hoped to establish peace with these tribe, uh, despite all of the uh, friendly back-and-forth banter. Uh, as winter was growing close, it led to some uh, hostilities between the two. Ah, these darn white-skinned guys, they're not earning their keep or something. They did trade food for uh, goods that the explorers had brought with them. When food became scarce, uh, the explorers, along with the Mandan, went out hunting for food. The Shehik and Black Cat, who are the chiefs from the Matutnaha and Ruhepte, uh, met often with Lewis and Clark, and the explorers participated in many Mandan ceremonies. When spring finally arrived, the expedition continued on its way. It doesn't say whether the Indians were happy to see them go or not. See you later. Have a nice trip. Don't come back. That kind of thing. The Indians were almost eradicated with smallpox. The last epidemic struck in 1937, which resulted in the Mandan population declining to a point where it was no longer considered to be an independent tribe. The Daughters of the American Revolution is made up of women who can trace direct lineage to people involved in the struggle for American independence. In 1953, the Society installed a plaque in Mobile, Alabama that extolled the virtues of Prince Maddox. The plaque was removed in 2008 when folks complained about it. The myth about Columbus discovering America is so strongly embedded in some folks that they get all hostile if you say anything different. Uh, telling people a Welch, Welch prince discovered the Americas will meet with a lecture of there's no written record to prove it. Uh, tell the same folks that the Vikings discovered the Americas and you just might start a fight. Leif Erikson was born in Iceland around 970. He spent his formative years in Greenland. Around the year 1000, Erikson sailed east to his ancestral homeland of Norway. King Olaf I converted him to Christianity and then sent him back to convert the pagan settlers in Greenland. Erikson managed to convert his mother who built the Greenland's first Christian church, but his father said no way, he wasn't having any of it. Rose Nyland, from the Golden Girls TV show, used to always talk about a town called St. Olaf, which was in northern Minnesota. The way she talked about the place, the town is thought to have been a fictional creation for the TV show, but this town actually exists. It was named for King Olaf I. So when you hear Rose talking about St. Olaf, there really is such a place. Exploration was a family business, and Life Erickson wanted to see what was just over the horizon. His father, Eric the Red, uh, founded the first European settlement in Greenland, and after being expelled from Iceland for killing a neighbor. Eric the Red's father, which would have been Life's grandfather, had also been thrown out of the country for committing manslaughter. It sounds like a violent family. Well, they were Vikings. What do you expect? Iceland legends called sagas 
recount Ericsson's exploits in the New World around A.D. 1000. These Norse stories were spread by word of mouth before becoming recorded in the 12th and 13th century. It wasn't until somebody developed a written language that they could write this stuff down. Two sagas give different accounts as to how Ericsson arrived in the North America. According to the saga of Eric the Red, Ericsson crossed the Atlantic by accident when he sailed past Greenland returning from Norway. He uh, missed his home destination. Uh, as he came across this huge landmass, the, the Viking explorer had heard of a strange land to the west of Iceland from a trader named Jorn Horjolson, who more than a decade earlier had overshot Greenland as well. And he sailed past the shores of North America, but he never stopped to look around. Ericsson bought the trailer's ship, raised a crew of 35 men, and he retra retraced the route. After crossing the Atlantic, the Vikings encountered a rocky, barren land in present-day Canada. Ericsson bestowed upon this land a name as descriptive as what he was looking at. Helluland, which is Old Norse for stone slab land. Researchers believe this location could possibly have been Baffin Island. The Norsemen then sailed south to a timber-rich location that they called Markland or Forest Land. The Norsemen kept sailing south until they came to an area that was filled with grapes. They called it was green with vegetation. They called this Newfoundland. The Vikings spent an entire winter there. They explored the surrounding region, which had lush meadows, rivers that were teeming with salmon, uh, wild grapes that were good for making wine. Uh, they decided to call this area Vinland or Wineland. After spending the winter in Vineland, Ericsson and his crew sailed home to Greenland with a ship, several ships filled with supplies of fish and grapes. Ericsson never returned to North America, but other Vikings continued to sail west to Vineland for at least the next decade or two. In spite of North America's more beautiful resources, bountiful resources, uh, the Vikings decided to stay in Greenland. If you've ever seen pictures of Greenland, you'll scratch your head and wonder why would they stay there instead of going to the, the New World. Uh, perhaps they had too many violent encounters with the locals. Ericsson's brother Thorwald had been killed during one encounter with the locals. Archaeologists have unearthed evidence that supports the saga story of the Norse expedition to the Americas. In 1960, Norwegian explorer Helg Ingolstad had searched the coast of Labrador and Newfoundland for signs of a Viking settlement. He eventually found it on the northernmost tip of Newfoundland at La Lance Ox Meadows. That must be a French word. A team of archaeologists he excavated the Viking artifacts a dating from around 1,000 years. The remains of the Viking village have been uncovered over the next couple of years. 1964, President Johnson signed a proclamation that declared October 9th to be Life Erickson Day in honor of the Viking explorer, his crew, and his fellow countrymen. October 9th was chosen because it is the anniversary of the 1825 arrival in New York of a ship called the Restoration, which carried the first organized band of Norwegian immigrants to the United States. Who else might have discovered America besides the Vikings and the Welsh? Folks using metal detectors keep finding bronze Roman coins in Maine that date back to the reign of Emperor Severus Alexander, who died in 235 A.D. 
1974, a similar coin was found not far from that location, dating to the same period. Fourth century coins were found in the sand dunes in Beverly, Massachusetts, on the North Shore, 26 miles from Boston. A Roman coin depicting Septimius Severus, who ruled Rome from 193 to 211 AD, was found in Grafton, Massachusetts. Another, dated from 80 AD, was uncovered near Presumpt Scott River in Westbrook, Maine. Two more coins, dating to 72 AD, were dug up using metal detectors near Bethel, Vermont. Other artifacts have been found suggesting the American Indians were trading with the Romans. 1976, a Brazilian skin diver, that's a lot of skin divers, a Brazilian skin diver found a large glass jar covered in mollusks near the Rio de Janeiro. Eventually, 14 other jars were brought to the surface as well. Over the years, the Brazilian government has decided to bring in a world-renowned underwater archaeologist to determine where the jars came from. The archaeologists discovered amphorae that were unquestionably cargo from a vessel that had traveled to Brazil when the Roman Empire was at the height of its power in the 3rd century AD. The archaeological expert located two underwater Roman wrecks as well. Roman coins were discovered washed up on the northeast coast of Venezuela. The age of the coins spanned a period from Caesar Augustus, which was 63 BC, to approximately 350 AD. The Columbus Discovered America crowd will yell, We don't believe it, so therefore it's not true. Uh, no amount of evidence will change their minds. Uh, they're still teaching this in school today. Could Roman ships in the first few centuries after Jesus have seaworthy enough to cross the Atlantic? If Polynesians could sail from Asia to Fiji or Tonga in open canoes 4,000 years ago, why couldn't the Romans have sailed across the Atlantic? One Roman cargo vessel was described as being 420 feet long, and it carried a thousand tons of freight. They had a passenger ship that could carry 600 passengers and crew. Now keep in mind, Columbus's ships were from 50 to 58 feet long. They have a replica. I think they have all, I'm not too sure if they have one or all three of the, uh, Columbus's fleet uh, docked in Corpus Christi, and when you get on board those ships, they are tiny. Now, these are just replicas. The original ships, well, they vanished a long time ago, but uh, it only takes a couple of steps to go from the, the bow to the stern of these boats. Uh, they were small, about the size of uh, my house, really. In 600 BC, the Phoenicians from Carthage were said by the Roman historian Herodotus to sail from Egypt around the continent of Africa in three-decked, 80-foot galleys. A cross-Atlantic voyage would have been about half of that distance. Uh, graffiti on various rocks in New Zealand have inscriptions in various languages of people that traveled to the New World. One in Iberic reads, Hanno takes possession of this place. Hanno was a merchant mariner from Carthage who sailed off seeking new lands from the west coast of Africa in 425 BC. He was never heard from again. The mummy of Ramses II, who lived from 1290 to 1224 BC, had tobacco intermixed with his wrappings. When they wrapped a mummy, they didn't just wrap them in linen. They wrapped them in linen and they stuffed things in between the strips. They also found coca leaves mixed in with the linen bindings. 
The coca plant was exclusively cultivated in the New World, and so was tobacco. It is more than likely that those responsible for supplying tobacco and coca to the Egyptian royal court and temples in around 1200 BC were the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians. With their thirst for open commerce, their sense of exploration, and their accomplished mariner uh, capabilities, uh, no other nation could have had these unique possessions. In 1787, workmen employed to construct a road from Cambridge to Malden in Massachusetts unearthed a large number of Carthaginian coins. They were brought to the attention of President John Quincy Adams, the copper and silver pieces were identified as coins minted in the 3rd century B.C. They bore short inscriptions in Kufic, a script used by the Carthaginians. Other Carthaginian coins were found in Waterbury, Connecticut. They belonged to an earlier issue of Carthage and were minted for military use in Punic, the Carthaginian language, and bore the image of a horse's head. A Punic type jars used to carry olives, liquids, and other items in ancient times were pulled up by Newburyport, Massachusetts fishermen in 1991, and two more were pulled up in Boston. Others were found in Caston and Jonesbury, Maine. Ryan, the guy that suggested I do the show about tiki's, had also said a little something about some mines. Uh, I didn't get to the mines last week, so this week here they are. My cat just knocked over a can of something. Approximately 5,000 ancient copper mines have been found around the northern shores of Lake Superior and adjacent Island Royale. Radiocarbon dating indicates that these mines were in operation 6,000 to 1,000 B.C corresponding to the Bronze Age in Europe. Tin was also needed since bronze is made from copper and tin, and it was mined in the Andes Mountains in Bolivia, high up in the mountains. Millions of pounds of copper and tin were extracted. Only a minuscule fraction of this copper can be accounted for among the artifacts of the Indians. The Minoans existed two to 4,000 years earlier than the Vikings, yet evidence showed they had far better ships and navigation ability than the Norsemen, who came along after them. Recover of a Minoan sailing vessel shows that they were longer, more seaworthy than the Viking ships. The Minoans were in close contact with the Babylonian Empire, which gave them access to very detailed and accurate star charts. Uh, these would allow them to navigate the sea at night. The Vikings didn't have these charts, but they did have that sunstone that they used. Those folks demanding evidence need no look no farther than what archaeologists have found. The tools used for mining in both European mines, known to be Minoan, and the Lake Superior mines are identical. The pottery and the utensils found in the Lake Superior mines are identical to those used in Minoan civilizations on Crete. The mines in Lake Superior are the only known Bronze Age mines to contain copper with a purity that exceeded 99%. Many European artifacts from this time period contain copper that can be traced back to Lake Superior. Hundred thousands of years before Old Chris. The mining of copper in Lake Superior ended abruptly and coincided with the sudden fall of the Minoan Empire. The descendants of the Minoans on Crete, European lands, and Middle Eastern countries where the Minoans were known to have significant interaction, have a genetic marker on their mitochondrial DNA known as Group X. In surveying the globe for other populations to have Group X, 
the Ojibwe and the Chippewa Indians in the vicinity of Lake Superior were the only other ones found to have this marker. It wasn't until 1824 that ships could sail from the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes. Uh, this didn't stop people from sailing there. Indians and explorers had to stop due to the Niagara Falls, but they soon figured out how to get around. You simply left your ocean-going ship at the bottom of the falls, you went up on top and built a new riverboat and continued on your way. It wasn't until 1848 that the Mississippi connected Lake Michigan. A stone was discovered in a dry creek bed in New Mexico by earlier settlers. It contained the Ten Commandments that were engraved in ancient Hebrew script. Hebrew scholar Cyrus Gordon of Brandeis University near Boston vouched for its authenticity. The Hebrew letters were of a style dated to about 1000 B.C. Uh, this would place the writing on the stone to the time of the kingdom of ancient Israel under the most powerful ruler, King Solomon, who reigned from 1014 B.C. to 974 B.C. The banana is an Asian plant which botanists say have no American genetic history. It was found in Mexico and Brazil when the Spanish explorers arrived. It was also found in Peruvian tombs dating back 8000 BC. The American sweet potato was found throughout the Pacific Islands by 12,000 BC, as was the American coconut, American cotton, and many other plants and animals. They had to have been spread by people who were trading with the ancient folks of the Americas. 1775, Phyllis Wheatley, a 14-year-old African-American girl, a free African-American girl, wrote a poem to George Washington that moved the general so much that he distributed it to all of his friends. In it, the term Columbia was used and is an allegorical representation of America. No doubt this is a rift on the female figure of Britannia. Uh, through written examples of Columbia, as old as 1761 exist, Wheatley's correspondence was the most popular. Apparently that girl could write. Soon Columbia and Columbus were appearing in songs, poems, and essays in newspapers around the colonies. Columbus went from a minor figure in the history of European explorers to an American hero practically overnight. People knew that Europeans, including Vikings and Portuguese, used to fish along the, the shores of the North American continent long before Columbus arrived. Other explorers had a better claim to encountering the New World. Political ideas used to increase favor for the revolution disqualified most of these well-known folks. Henry Hudson was just too British. Uh, Giovanni Caboto had his name anglicized to John Cabot, and he also sailed for the British. Uh, it was hard to convince colonists there was a legitimate excuse to break from King George if his fellow countrymen had found the place. Juan Ponce de Leon was already the hero of Spain. Giovanni de Verrazzano was considered to be a hero of the colonists, but he'd been eaten by the Carib Indians, and it made for not so appetizing a figurehead. Columbus was brought up, and since very little was known about the man, good, bad, or otherwise, his name was used to create a new national history. Until his death, Columbus publicly insisted that he had, in fact, landed in East Asia. And he, uh, he said he was communicating with folks from the Far East, not from the Americas. That's why he called the lands that he found the West Indies. 
He was neither an especially talented mariner nor a success at founding a colony in the New World. All of his colonists got killed or chased off by the locals. The few written records of his voyages, including a biography by his son Ferdinand and the 16th century history by Bartolome de la Casas, were unavailable in the New World. They were not translated into English until long after the Revolution. The only detailed history of Columbus and his voyages available to the colonies was written by Scotsman William Robertson in 1777. The author depicted Columbus as an explorer of noble intent, bringing civilization to the savages, those savage Indians. Most Indians were far more civilized than those folks sailing over from Europe. Robertson described Columbus as a man stifled by the rigors of the old world and yearning to set his own course. He wanted to begin a new world. A Columbus mania swept the nation during the Revolution, mostly because of Robertson's created history. A flood of poems and odes were hammered out in the name of Columbus, he was the Charles Lindbergh and the Neil Armstrong of the 1700s. Like Columbus, the colonies were shedding the yoke of the old world. Columbus Day was created as a federal holiday in the United States by President Roosevelt in 1937 after being lobbied by the Knights of Columbus, which is an organization of largely Italian descent, Roman Catholic membership. Uh, the designated date of October 12th was the anniversary of Columbus's landing in the Caribbean islands. Why are these two continents called the Americas instead of, oh, say, Colombia's? In 1497, Amerigo Vespucci, another Italian explorer, claimed to have actually discovered the continent. He was five years behind old Chris. He pointed out that Columbus never actually landed in the New World. In 1507, Martin Walsemuller was drawing up a map showing the entire world, well, as much of it as they knew about. On this map was this big chunk of land to the far side of the Atlantic. Martin had to call it something. You can't just leave a big blank mass of land. So he hauled out Vespucci's name and he called it America. Later on, the North and the South continents were given their own designations. You have to wonder, where did the Indians come from? They were here first, so they should get credit for discovering America. I searched for an answer and I found dozens. Uh, most, well, not most, a lot of people keep saying that they crossed from Siberia using the Barren Straits land bridge. Remember, that's just a theory. Nobody actually knows if it ever existed. There is no DNA connecting Indians to Siberia. I found one claim saying that folks living in France decided to head west back when the ice sheet connected Europe and America. Uh, some guy said, hey, look, let's walk 4,000 miles out across the ice and see what's out there. I think they would have frozen to death somewhere around Ponta Delgada. In another site, I read the Indian population originated from three separate waves of migration from Africa, Iran, and Central Asia about 50,000 years ago. All of these reports claim to be the most accurate record of the history of where the Indians came from. Once again, I am forced to say, we don't know. Our history is written by people who want to control how we think. You can't trust the government or the daily news anymore. Uh, too many historians have their own books that they want to sell. If you have a UFO, a ghost story, or a cryptid encounter that you'd like to share, I'm looking for true accounts to put in my next book. 
you can contact me at strangethings at arcanasa.com. That is A-R-C-A-N-A-S-A. Even if all you have are the dates and the places of the, of the event, send me a note. I'll try and fill out the story. I'll do some research and see what I can find. Hope you enjoyed tonight's show. If you did, spread the word. Tell people they should be listening in as well. I could always use the, the numbers on my uh, listeners. I don't know why. I'm not getting paid for it, but it's always nice to look down there and, and realize that a couple thousand people out there are listening. Till next time, this is Chris James for Strange Things. I was going to hum the music, but nah, you don't want to hear me humming. Later.